For those of, who, of you who may not know me, I'm Bill Potter. I have the, uh, the privilege of directing the center, James Barton Center for Nonproliferation Studies. Um, I'm really delighted uh, that so many of you have chosen to, uh, to join us today. We have a truly international audience, uh, a few of us in Monterey, others scattered about the United States, and we also have uh, at least Vienna and, Gen and Berlin uh, represented here and, and, and possibly uh, other international uh, venues as well. As, as many of you know, I've often admonished my CNS colleagues uh, for not sharing their ongoing research in a timely fashion with CNS staff. And so I thought I would be remiss uh, if I didn't uh, convene this seminar today for the purpose of describing what I believe is a very uh, ambitious and exciting uh, work in progress. Uh, this is a project that focuses on the sources and process of Russian military innovation uh, with particular reference to five uh, uh, missile delivery systems. Uh, some have referred to these systems as exotic, some have referred to, it, to them as invincible. Uh, we prefer the more modest, perhaps uh, neutral uh, term of novel. These are uh, novel systems um, that were highlighted uh, first in a March 2018 speech by President Vladimir Putin to the Russian Federal Assembly, four of them, and a fifth one was um, unveiled in 2019. Of these systems, some appear to be uh, direct responses to perceived advances in U.S. weapons innovations, uh, especially in the sphere of missile defense. Others, however, are likely to have uh, more domestic origins and may be the product of scientific breakthroughs, uh, the work of uh, scientific uh, or technological entrepreneurs, uh, the consequence of bureaucratic, bureaucratic competition, and other economic and organizational considerations. What we're attempting to do in our project is to analyze the progression of these five systems through the entire innovation cycle. In other words, from conception to development to testing, and uh, when relevant, also mass production uh, and deployment. Our research approach uh, is uh, really one that was pioneered by actually Dr. Jeffrey Knopf's mentor and, and mine as well at Stanford University, Alexander George, which involves structured focused comparison to assess the explanatory power of different variables on policy outcomes by essentially addressing the same set of questions across multiple cases. In this instance, five novel Russian uh, military missile delivery systems. The impetus uh, for the project was several fold. First of all, several members of the team, uh, namely Sarah Bidgood and myself, had previously conducted work on another ultimately unsuccessful military innovation in both the United States and the Soviet Union, the pursuit, the testing, but ultimately the failure to deploy radiological weapons. And in the course of that research, we were quite impressed by the explanatory power of a conceptual framework proposed by a scholar uh, about whom uh, Sarah will speak uh, in, in more detail, uh, Matthew Evangelista. What was interesting was that Evangelista's work, which is now over three decades old, uh, uh, was intriguing, appeared to explain things with respect to Soviet uh, uh, military innovation, uh, but it hasn't really been applied uh, very much subsequently. And so we were curious to see whether it might help us better understand uh, contemporary Russian military innovation. And the second impetus that I will men would mention was that we had been encouraged to apply for a US government uh, grant on the topic of our project, but were eventually told uh, that uh, it would not be feasible to conduct that research without access to uh, classified uh, material, classified information. So that was a challenge that I couldn't resist and therefore set about to demonstrate, at least to ourselves, if not the US government, that in fact, one did not need classified data to conduct such a study. In short, our project is a form of a proof of concept. 
uh, and I would say that you uh, have the opportunity today, uh, at least in part, to judge if we have succeeded uh, in our enterprise. The project has been a truly collaborative effort involving five CMS experts. In addition to myself, the team includes uh, Ms. Sarah Bidgood, uh, Mr. Michael Bootsman, uh, Dr. Nikolai Sokoff, and Dr. Hanna Note. Uh, Michael, Sarah, and Nikolai are well known to you. Hmm. Dr. Note, however, is a relative newcomer to CNS, and although she's been a non-resident scholar with us for about nine months, today marks the day when she was supposed to begin work full-time in our Washington, D.C. office. However, uh, due to both visa and pandemic travel restrictions, Anna works with us as a senior non-resident scholar based in Berlin. I'm tempted to say uh, more about the project, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm simply going to ask uh, first Sarah and Michael and then Hannah to speak. We've agreed that uh, because of time constraints, uh, we're not going to have Nikolai make uh, any formal remarks, uh, but I'm sure that he will join us in the uh, Q&A and we've kind of agreed amongst ourselves if they're particularly difficult questions and we'll direct them to, to Nikolai uh, to respond. And so let me turn at this point uh, to Sarah and Michael who will start us uh, off with uh, what may be a tag team presentation. I kind of leave it to you, Sarah, to take the, the first step and you can let us know how you and Michael plan to present. So the floor, virtual floor is all yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Bill. And um, thank you to everybody very much for being here. It's so nice to virtually see so many familiar faces. Um, I, the way that Michael and I are going to kick off the presentation is I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the theoretical underpinnings of our of our research and try to sort of suss out some of the framework that, that Bill briefly mentioned that Matt Evangelista who I note is also Jeff Knopp's former roommate from undergrad, um, uh, presented for describing uh, this process of Soviet weapons innovation. And then I'm going to um, describe a little bit of how you know, that sort of surfaced some questions for us that we wanted to explore in our research and the ways in which that framework has helped us to interpret our results. Um, and then Michael's gonna talk us through some of the technical spec of the weapons and Hannah is going to present some of our preliminary conclusions from this proof of concept. So, Bear with me for one second. I'm going to start sharing my screen so that you can see our PowerPoint. Um, great. Okay. So um, now I don't want your eyes to kind of glaze over here just because this is the theoretical section. I'm going to try to keep this uh, pretty surface level. And the good news for you is that we don't really try to test theory in this proof of concept study. We really use the existing literature to inform uh, the way that we designed our study and, and the way that we analyzed the results we were able to derive. But I think the most important thing to kind of um, cover at the outset is the fact that, that, you know, we're specifically talking about weapons innovation as part of this case study. And what we mean by that is the process by which an invention is transformed into a concrete product that's then adopted by an organization. And so in our definition, this is, this is really separate from the process of invention, which is when an original idea is, is kind of generated and separately from diffusion, which is what happens after an idea or an approach is, is uh, diffused to, to other entities. Um, and, and from my vantage, you know, just like most kind of taxonomies, and Michael's going to talk about some of the others that we use in the study, these distinctions really matter because they let us compare where these five systems that we're examining here are on this timeline. Um, and they kind of surface some important questions about why it is that, that some of the systems we look at, and I'm thinking here in particular about Kinjal and Avangard, have completed the process of weapons innovation uh, using the definition that, that we identify above, while some of the other ones, um, you know, Burovesnik, Tsirkon, um, have, have not uh, had that happen to them. And so we're kind of curious about understanding why that is and, and using this definition of innovation helps us um, uh, be able to have that conversation. And then more broadly, using this definition of innovation that's fairly narrow compared to some of the other literature also lets us explore with, with greater precision how the process of Russian innovation in itself uh, has, has evolved over time. So we're looking not just at a snapshot of what that process looks like now, but perhaps how has it changed uh, from the Soviet period. Um, so yes, innovation is the name of the game for our study here. 
Um, so I want to begin by characterizing a little bit the this kind of scholarly discourse that does already exist on innovation, because as Bill mentioned in his introductory remarks, you know, part of what we're trying to do here is kind of contribute to this bigger discourse about understanding the way that weapons innovation happens in, in Russia and elsewhere. Um, so there is a very rich literature on what drives innovation. Um, that's one of the things that that Bill and I and our colleague Sam Meyer discovered when we were doing this previous research. Um, and Bill has written extensively on these issues as well in his own scholarship. But much of this is kind of focused on, on organizations and bureaucratic politics and some on technology. There's very little that is narrowly focused on weapons or military innovation specifically. And like many things, good luck to you if you're conducting research on you know, Soviet or Russian weapons innovation because there is, there is really very little there. Um, so we wanted in our study and through our findings to contribute to and enhance and complicate this literature by answering some questions specifically about the drivers and inhibitors of Russian weapons innovation today, the extent to which they have changed or remained the same since the Soviet period and how the kind of political and economic changes that resulted from the collapse of the Soviet Union might have shaped these processes and how this can inform our understanding of the future war fighting landscape and whether this might uh, uh, raise some, some potential opportunities for arms control that haven't been considered yet. And so what we're really doing here through this study is using Russia's novel weapon systems as a lens through which to examine these questions. We're not focused um, in particular on kind of um, identifying or gathering new information that nobody has yet discovered about the technical specifications of these weapons. Although I think Michael has done a tremendous job along with Nikolai and others of, of kind of gathering and, um, and putting forward some, some new information on this point as well. So as I mentioned at the outset in my, in my entreaty not to be scared, we, we're not really engaging in explicit theory testing in this study. So we're not taking a theoretical framework and saying, you know, does what we're able to observe about Russian weapon systems support or undercut uh, the validity of that particular theory. But we, we do use a number of sources that sort of provide some theoretical frameworks to inform our design and our findings. And as Bill mentioned, um, Matthew Evangelista's Innovation and the Arms Race, How the United States and the Soviet Union Developed New Military Technologies, which he, he wrote in 1988, um, is one that we've really focused on in our work in particular. And that's the one that I'm going to sort of spend the most time explaining. Um, but in the process, we've also been helped by a number of studies and, and previously published research that sort of adds important context to some of the ideas that Evangelista is putting forward, and in some cases challenges or complicates, um, I think, the, the way that he has laid out the process of, of Soviet weapons innovation in really helpful ways. And so these include um, John Hines's now declassified interviews that he conducted with uh, Soviet and American uh, policy and decision makers and military decision makers to understand Soviet intentions. Um, they also include very usefully Andy Aldrin's 1996 dissertation, which looked at innovation um, and the role of kind of scientists and entrepreneurs in programmatic uh, innovation within the context of the Soviet space program. So we found that to be extremely helpful. Um, another one that we've looked at is, is Harvey Balzer's work. He was um, writing one year after Matthew Evangelista, looking at the way that the kind of scientific environment in, in the Soviet Union was reforming or being transformed as a result of uh, Pietrostroika and kind of trying to predict what that might look like and what the impact might be. Um, also, of course, uh, Boris talks canonical uh, rockets and people also provided some, some important insight. And then the last one here is Michael Horowitz's adoption capacity theory, which is really, I would say, the, the most um, classic sort of theory that, that, we, that we do apply to some extent in our study, which he lays out in, in his 2010 book, The Diffusion of Military Power. But again, the study is not focused on sort of testing the validity of that theory. It's using it for its explanatory uh, value. Um, so to focus a little bit and drill down on, on sort of Matthew Evangelista's findings before I turn it back over to Michael, um, I think the most important things to know about, about Matt's book is that you know, he was able to identify five real stages of Soviet weapons innovation. The first of these was stifled innovation. So um, there were a lot of forces, uh, including the, the centralization of the Soviet uh, military, its formalization, its lack of organizational slack, as he calls it, so the opportunity to kind of use resources to do innovation, 
and the quality of the workforce all served to stifle innovation broadly in the Soviet setting. Um, at some points, though, he did find that there were initial kind of research efforts to try to determine what types of weapon systems might be feasible or useful, and he saw these happening in the preparatory measures stage of innovation. But then the real turning point comes with, with high-level response. And what Matt finds is that it was only really after a foreign threat was identified in the Soviet Union with you know, credible intelligence that the Soviet political leadership would muster together the resources uh, to initiate an innovation and really kind of um, ensure that there was broad support for that type of work. So that was a real point of inflection in, in Evangelista's research in, in, in kind of um, the process of weapons innovation. And then after you pass that turning point is when you see the mobilization of mass resources, um, the real uh, kind of coming together uh, to, to support uh, a weapon system to getting through the innovation process and then eventually reaching the stage of, of mass production. So we really wanted to understand in particular in our study, you know, is this relationship between um, a perceived th foreign threat and a high level response still something that is salient in Russian weapons innovation today? And do we see that manifest in the five novel weapon systems uh, that we're looking at in their development? So we decided, as Michael is going to describe, to, to trace the innovation process um, for the five systems that we're looking at to determine, you know, first and foremost, whether Evangelista's observations about Soviet weapons innovation still apply to Russian weapons innovation. So that's kind of a, one big question that we wanted to look at. But then to, to unpack that a little bit, we wanted to look at, you know, what are the external threats that are driving Russian weapons innovation today? And, and are foreign threats still this main driver or are there other domestic drivers um, that we should really be focusing on? And uh, in conjunction with that, which internal factors, including things like you know, bureaucratic, technical, financial, and economic considerations have the greatest impact on determining whether new weapon systems are ultimately incorporated into Russia's military arsenal. So what is it that allows some systems to make it the whole way through this innovation system and what stops others from ever quite reaching that finish line? So as I said, um, our main model here was to conduct uh, a pretty significant amount of open source research on both the history and the current status of the systems that we're looking at. And I'm going to turn the floor over to Michael to take you through some of the results of what we found. But Michael, I'll advance your slides for you. So you just let me know uh, when you're ready for the next one. Okay, thank you. Um, if I mute myself and disappear really quick, it's because I am downstairs in the kitchen with my landlady's dog, and that dog is exceptionally obnoxious. Um, so we looked at five systems. I'm going to run through these really, really fast. Um, we could talk a lot more about them, but for the interest of time, we're only, we're gonna, I'm gonna try to run through this in about six minutes. So we looked at the Avangard, Burovesnik, Poseidon, Kinjal, and Zircon. But one of the problems we encountered early on is that the language we use to label missiles, such as ICBM, IRBM, MRBM, SLBM, is not really illustrative of the properties and capabilities of these systems. So uh, next slide, please. Earlier this year in August, um, Stephen Dunham and Robert Wilson at the Aerospace Corporation published a paper that proposed a new taxonomy for missile systems organized by both range and payload category. So if you look at this, there is in the rows, it is divided by range, close, short, medium, intermediate, and intercontinental. And the columns divide it by payload category. So traditional ballistic, ballistic with impulsive propulsion, which is similar, which is like a um, MERV bus, aerodynamic, so a glider, an unpowered glider, aerodynamic with impulsive propulsion, which is a winged missile that has a rocket engine, and aerodynamic with sustainer propulsion, which is a cruise missile, essentially, um, a missile with an air-breathing engine. So the payload categories are one through five, and the range categories are the, the, the character labels. Uh, next slide, please. So avant-garde is 
an ICM-3. It's an intercontinental range missile carrying a single warhead in an unpowered aerodynamically maneuvering hypersonic boost glide vehicle. And this builds on technology that's been around for quite a while. Um, aerodynamic maneuvering on reentry was demonstrated by the space shuttle among other systems and maneuvering warheads have been around since the early 80s. Um, this is the first time it's actually reached a deployment level though. Uh, the first two missiles were put on alert last December. And the Russians have been working on this system since I think the very late 80s or early 90s. It was originally conceived as a response to SDI. I, I'm sure my colleagues will correct me if I'm wrong on that. Um, next slide, please. Burevesnik is probably the strangest of these systems. Um, it is an intercontinental range, nuclear powered, sustainer propelled, aerodynamically maneuvering cruise missile or an ICM-5. And this is the system that was probably responsible for the explosion in Yonoksa last August in 2019. Um, the Russians have played around with uh, nuclear powered cruise missiles since since we were working on Project Pluto in the 50s, but they were also working on them on and off on, at a proposal level into the early 80s. And it probably builds on Russian experience with very small reactors for space purposes. Although if, as I sort of expect, it is a um, air breathing reactor that, in, that creates a whole new set of challenges, although I could talk for probably 10 to 20 minutes on that alone. Um, next slide. Poseidon is a nuclear powered intercontinental range torpedo or autonomous uncrewed underwater vehicle. Um, I mean, nuclear submarines have been around for quite a while. Making them this small is not really something we've seen though. The Russians played around, had in service small um, nuclear attack submarines, the Alpha class, and this probably builds on some of the automation technology used there, and it might also use some of the reactor technology. It's not entirely clear to me if it is a lead bismuth cooled reactor or a pressurized water reactor. Um, the Russians claim it can move 200 kilometers an hour based on the shapes we've seen like in this picture. That doesn't sound right because this, this picture is definitely not um, what we would expect for a uh, something like the Shkval, which is a high-speed torpedo. This probably moves at no more than 50 knots. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Kinjal is an air-launched aerodynamically maneuvering aeroballistic missile or an MRM-3. Um, it is probably based on the Russian Iskander short-range ballistic missile. And it builds on the Russian love for strapping very large payloads to the MiG-31, and which is something that happened in the 80s with an anti-satellite system. They were looking at it again for um, a space launch system in the late 90s and early 2000s. This is the first one that's ever actually been launched though. And it ex entered experimental combat duty in 2018. It is intended primarily, I think, for anti-ship use, but also for um, ground targets. And the range given here is also includes the range of the launch aircraft. And lastly, next slide, the Zircon is a sustainer propelled aerodynamically maneuvering short range anti-ship missile uh, or an SRM-5. Um, We've never actually seen a Zircon, so what we have here is a drawing from a Russian patent and a picture of the Boeing Wave Rider to give an idea of what it would look like. It is probably the first service, it will probably be the first scramjet propelled missile to enter service. It's still in testing, but the Russians are confident that it'll be in service in the early to mid 2020s because the Russian Navy has historically been heavily reliant on large anti-ship missiles 
because they don't really have, I mean, they only have one aircraft carrier, so they need another way to counter enemy um, naval forces. So, next. Okay, I think it, Hannah, I think you're you're up here. Okay, um, great. Well, first of all, it's very nice to join this seminar on the first day of my formally enhanced role with uh, CNS, and I'm very glad to be joining uh, distinguished colleagues on this project who have looked at Soviet and Russian military innovation for quite some time. So, with uh, Sarah and Michael having gone through the specific systems and also with Sarah having, having given the conceptual and theoretical background to this proof of concept, um, I might summarize some of the broad findings to have emerged so far from this uh, structured comparison and particularly in light of uh, the theoretical literature which we, we kept in mind as we conducted this research. And I should stress again that these are preliminary findings because we're only in, in the early stages of a longer research effort. So I want to start with the external drivers and pushing the innovation cycle behind these systems. All systems were one way or another conceived in response to a um, perceived external problem set faced by the Russian military. Either that of how to enhance strategic deterrence vis-a-vis -vis the United States or that of how to meet specific uh, warfighting needs. Now let's start with the first, with strategic deterrence. The original idea behind avant-garde or the Albatross program as it was called during Soviet times and partially also Budavestnik and Poseidon was provoked by the US efforts in developing missile defenses. Initially with the SDI in the 1980s and then certainly later towards the late 1990s with the Rumsfeld Commission report in 1998, then the National Missile Defense Act a year later, and then certainly with the US abrogation of the ABM treaty, that added further urgency on the Russian side to revive, either revive or uh, push these systems forward in the innovation cycle. And actually about 11, 12 days ago, um, there was a award ceremony where Vladimir Putin gave the Order of St. Andrew to Gerbert Yefremov, the honorary chief designer of NPO MASH, NPO Machina Strayenia, where he actually addressed these systems again, in particular avant-garde and Russia's interest in hypersonic technology, where he made that point about missile defenses quite clear again. And I just quote from Putin's remarks here, this is just 10, 12 days ago. He said, the US withdrawal from the ABM treaty in 2002 forced Russia to start designing hypersonic weapons. In the ensuing years, we made every possible effort to achieve agreements with the US side on stopping work on the strategic anti-missile defense systems. However, all our attempts pr proved futile. So there was clearly here an external driver in the case of, of these systems enhancing strategic deterrence by creating assets that would be able to either penetrate or circumvent US missile defenses uh, behind the initial pursuit of these uh, systems. And of course, the concern here was not so much with existing but rather with anticipated uh, future US missile defense capabilities, which also probably led the Russian military to inflate the perceived threat at the time in order to generate the, the support for these expensive programs. And so we can say that while Evangelista, who, who, who Sarah referenced, had characterized Soviet uh, weapons innovation as reactive, oftentimes reactive, a high level response to a, a foreign threat, meaning that innovation was suppressed until intelligence indicated that an adversary was pursuing a very specific capability, we could say that this pattern remains partially relevant today, at least with regards to these systems. Now turning to a, a second external driver, to warfighting needs, the idea behind Kinjal and Sirkon came actually from the Russian military's perceived need, and I think in particular after the 1999 Kosovo war, to counter a US ability to wage war with long range precision guided capabilities. Both these systems, Sirkan and Kinjal, have impressive capabilities 
to penetrate multi-layered US defenses. Um, and they also strengthened the notion of uh, Russian non-nuclear deterrence, which was more formally introduced in the 2014 um, military doctrine. And I'm sure Nikolai would wish to say a few more words on that in the, in the subsequent Q&A. Um, and then Poseidon is actually a useful case study to show how different external drivers can combine in a Russian innovation program. So when Putin unveiled the system, he defined it as a multi-purpose system that can support different missions. It can also support the strategic deterrence mission with a so-called deep second strike, but also Russia's warfighting mission because it, it helps the Russian Navy compensate for numerical and technological inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the US Navy. And so here it essentially supports a similar mission to Zircon. And it's somewhat difficult to determine which of these two external missions served to justify the program at the outset. But the fact that it is described as a multi-purpose weapon, essentially a weapon that can kill two birds with one stone, uh, that fact probably helped sustain uh, support for what uh, is a fairly expensive program. Um, now I want to turn to the role of internal drivers and in also pushing the innovation cycle behind these systems forward. Of course, the industry and, and the design bureaus played an important role in the process as well, because they proposed specific ideas or projects that would address the broad, either strategic deterrent or warfighting need identified by the Russian military. And in doing so, um, the Russian design bureaus have shown an inclination to, to suggest asymmetric responses. So responses which would not just match or balance US capabilities, but actually seek to undermine them. So actually, you could say that with regards to these so-called exotic systems, we are not just seeing the type of uh, catching up that was described by Evangelista and, and also Heinz, I believe, with regards to Soviet military innovation. It's not just about catching up, it's about adopting an asymmetric approach here. Um, the industry has not just looked for asymmetric responses, it has also to some extent with regards to these different systems, relied on legacy R&D programs and engineering solutions. So Avant-Garde, for instance, was based on it, or is based on a prototype, the Albatross that was built during the Soviet period. Uh, Kinjal and Silicon equally benefited from previous R&D programs. And then maybe just a last word on internal drivers uh, of these systems. They have all produced in one way or another certain spin-off or ancillary benefits for the military or for the industry, um, which can also help explain sustained commitment to these very costly projects, some of which have faced significant uh, challenges and setbacks in recent years. If we think about avant-garde, for instance, or even the lack of clarity with, with Burevestnik and, and where Burevestnik is going. Uh, for instance, both avant-garde and Kinjal further the Russian interest in pioneering in, in hypersonic technology, whereas Poseidon has benefited the Russian Navy more broadly, which has undertaken upgrades to its existing uh, capabilities in order to deploy Poseidon. And um, given the, the potentially widespread applicability of these miniaturized uh, nuclear reactors for the Russian space program or other military settings, Borovestnik as a sort of um, multi-purpose research program could also see further benefits to, to the Russian military um, that little might be known about at this stage. Um, I'll probably end here. And yeah, I think uh, Nikolai, who has actually conducted much of the analysis on the specific systems alongside Michael, as well as other colleagues and myself, would be happy to take further questions. I believe Nikolai might also be able to say a few words about um, arms control implications of these systems in any further arms control agreements, which I'm sure might be an interesting topic for discussion as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you, Michael. I think before uh, we turn uh, back to our panelists, I, I really uh, want to give the, the audience a chance to, uh, to ask questions, and, and I, I'm sure we can. 
uh, factor in or fold in a number of uh, other things that uh, we might have said but chose not to say uh, uh, in response to the question. So I'm not uh, discounting Nikolai's contribution here, but I think it's best uh, having kind of had the floor for 50 minutes to uh, uh, let some of our uh, other distinguished uh, uh, parties ask questions. So I'm a little bit intimidated. I see Sig Hecker there. And so I Sig, uh, don't press too hard on the technical side here. <laughs> but uh, who would like, I mean, let, me, let me see, I, I don't have all of you on the screen here. So the chat function is probably best, but if uh, you have difficulty using that, uh, don't hesitate to, to raise your hand physically. If you can't uh, either raise your hand or ask uh, for the floor through, uh, through chat. Who would like to get us started here? And uh, Sig, okay, I see you Sig, because you're one of the six on my, my screen at the top here. So uh, it's such, such a shame we can't be meeting in person, uh, uh, Sig, but uh, I'm delighted that you joined us for the, uh, the call. So maybe you want to introduce yourself and then uh, ask the question. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Sig Hecker from Stanford, uh, although currently I'm sitting much closer to my old home of Los Alamos than I am to Stanford. Uh, I'm here in our Santa Fe, New Mexico home. Uh, haven't been back to uh, California all year, but plan to get back there next week if all things go well. So uh, I've, uh, I've spent most of my career in, in the nuclear business. For those of you who don't know me, uh, much of my career at Los Alamos. And I've also done a lot of work uh, with the Russians. Uh, first, of course, uh, to make sure we can deter them in the first 25 years of my career, and then the next 25 years trying to work with them. Uh, and so I've had lots of experience working uh, with the Russians. And, and so my, my question is along this line of, of uh, where you talk about the innovation uh, from industry or, or the innovation from design bureaus. Uh, and uh, uh, what I'm curious is to how much do you know as how much of the innovation uh, is driven by, I sort of look at the, at the sector as having two major components. You know, one is the nuclear part, and so those would be the nuclear weapons laboratories uh, in Sarov, in Snezhensk, uh, and also uh, in Moscow, uh, or the, the missile uh, strategic forces sector. So do, do you have any idea, have you been able to track down as, where, where are the primary sources of innovation and, and how closely do those two sectors uh, work together? The reason I asked that question, for example, since I've spent so much of my time uh, at Los Alamos, uh, is we were always innovating. <laughs> you know, there was essentially, there was never a time when there weren't some large number of people at the laboratory that were looking at new systems almost regardless of what the external threats were. That was just what you did, and especially during the nuclear testing days. So they were always innovating, always thinking. And then, so instead of, uh, of having uh, uh, Sarah, as you point out, very nice to see you, Sarah, uh, very nice uh, presentation. Instead of having this sort of, uh, you know, the, the idea of innovation uh, and then going on from there, what we had in the nuclear weapons business is sort of phase one, phase two, and phase three. Uh, and so phase one, that, that was the uh, innovation part of the phase. That's when our people were thinking of all these new ideas that I could do. And then it wasn't until phase two, you started thinking as to how would you actually incorporate this. And then phase three was when you actually got an assignment to go ahead and designed a warhead and then made that warhead, warhead to some delivery system. So I'm trying to get some idea on the Russian side. Uh, how much do you know of, of how that works? Sorry for the long question, but thank you for listening. Thanks, Sig. Let me uh, say a, a brief word or two in response, and then I'm, I'm pleased to let others uh, kind of weigh in here. I think, first of all, uh, you know, Sarah sought uh, to be, I think, quite precise in terms of our usage of terminology and the need to distinguish between kind of invention and innovation and also then the diffusion of innovation. And so uh, when we are using the term innovation, we're talking about uh, a cycle which starts with the creativity that you made reference to. Uh, we would probably refer to it as invention, but it, we're basically talking about creativity 
uh, but that in itself is not an innovation. The innovation uh, really requires uh, a number of other phases uh, leading ultimately uh, to a decision to produce, uh, to test, uh, to and actually deploy in one's arsenal. And so I think there, there are far fewer innovations on the, on the Russian military side uh, than there are uh, creative uh, uh, activities looking at new ways of doing things. And the same would apply to, to the United States. So we try to be fairly precise, and which is one reason why we, even though uh, uh, talking about in the Soviet period uh, and in the earlier US period, uh, both sides invested considerable amounts of money uh, in the development of radiological weapons, leading actual to, actually to uh, extensive testing, neither side ultimately chose to produce uh, uh, systems in a mass uh, form or to deploy them uh, in their arsenals. And so from our standpoint, this doesn't, uh, the use of radiological weapons doesn't constitute a military innovation. Um, I would say also before I, I maybe let Nikolai respond if, if he, he wants to, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the uh, amount of uh, information on the Russian process that we have on the Soviet process. And I think the best example of this really is a, I, what I think is a superb dissertation that I've never seen cited before in the literature, and that is Andrew Aldrin's uh, study on uh, the uh, Soviet space program which I found uh, fascinating uh, in part because it showed, I mean, it focused in particular on a single innovation champion, Sergei Karofiev, who uh, uh, from you know, his time during the war, uh, after the war, uh, and for decades persisted in promoting uh, technological advances, less because he was interested in developing Soviet missiles and mainly because what he really wanted to do was space exploration. Uh, and so you, you found this very, very complex innovation process in which he was able to uh, secure the patronage of one key party, uh, Ustinov, who basically who was close to Stalin uh, and it gave him tremendous power to do what he as a scientist wanted to do, but he also had to play the game with the military. And, and so uh, we have great uh, detail available to understand the actual process uh, by which the innovation proceeded to its ultimate uh, kind of conclusion. Uh, we don't have that same kind of information because we don't have the interviews uh, that uh, enabled uh, you know, Aldrin to conduct his research. So uh, the extent that we have information is probably more because of people like Nikolai uh, who were actually involved uh, to some extent uh, through their arms control negotiation work uh, with both the scientists uh, and industry and the political figures. Uh, and so we're operating more inferentially, I would say, uh, in terms of our research with these five weapon systems. But Nikolai, perhaps you would also like to, to, uh, to respond to uh, the SIG's uh, very interesting question. Yes, thank you, Bill. Uh, so good to see you again, Zig. Uh, it's been a very long time. Uh, uh, well, it's a very good question, uh, primarily because it's a very, actually, a very difficult question. <laughs> um, uh, so when you talk about the nuclear kind of side, uh, well, I think it's important uh, to differentiate between uh, nuclear warheads for delivery vehicles uh, that were developed. Uh, recently and uh, all of them are, are dual capable. So yes, we do talk about nuclear uh, warheads uh, that will be loaded on them all if necessary. Yes, and of course work on that has never stopped and the work uh, became more active about 20 years ago uh, to develop uh, uh, warheads that would fit uh, the new dual capable weapons. A uh, much more challenging question is actually about engines. So when we talk about Budavestnik, when they talk about Poseidon, uh, they got the nuclear engine there and uh, uh, the question who was driving the program, uh, all of the people who worked on the missile 
or people who worked on the engine, I don't think we can find an answer here. Uh, paradoxically, however, it might not matter as much as it might seem, uh, because uh, one thing that does actually strike me uh, on Russian R&D uh, procedures uh, is uh, uh, many more uh, joint actual programs between labs. So the horizontal ties uh, within the Russian defense industry uh, all appears more robust uh, than was the case in the Soviet Union. Uh, so, so in the Soviet Union, it was a very uh, stovepipe sort of system where, uh, for example, uh, even uh, the missile uh, industry was actually divided into several different ministries and they had uh, quite few actual connections between them. Uh, uh, they very seriously competed for contracts. Uh, and it was, well, as some people actually said, uh, 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 that they hated the other ministry um, much more intensely than the Americans. So, uh, kind of uh, like Los Alamos and, and Livermore, perhaps. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure, yes, that's exactly the case. It's everywhere, <laughs> yes. Um, and so, what we see actually now is many more actually joint programs where different labs uh, cooperate on the weapon. And I would actually suspect uh, that when we talk about Poseidon and Burevestnik, uh, well, it was more like a joint invention. Uh, probably actually Burevestnik uh, had more weight of uh, or the engine designers, but it is difficult uh, or to ascertain. That's um, um, more of a hunch there. Thanks, Nikolai. We'll, we'll return probably to the, this point again. Let me, I have on the chat function, I think George Moore and, and Ian Stewart. So um, uh, it, I'll turn next to George if uh, you're, you'd like to ask your question. Um, yeah, I put it on the chat, Bill. Um, my question was about the current weapons ac acquisition system. Uh, we used to joke about the fact that the Russians, to our perception, had a capitalistic system where design bureaus competed for uh, new designs. There were a lot of perks that f flowed to the successful bureaus, whereas the U.S. had a communist system where we equally distributed the wealth among the big corporations and laboratories. Um, my question is, is that still the way the, the Russian Federation is working on developing these weapon systems? Okay, thank, uh, thank you. Do well, I have one of my uh, team members who wants to take a shot at uh, uh, responding to George's uh, excellent question? Nikolai is shaking his head vigorously, Bill. Okay. Go, go for it, Nicholas. Well, yes, I was just trying to indicate that, yes, I'm actually ready to answer. Uh, George, uh, I would not say that the Soviet system was capitalist in any kind of way. There was a lot of log rolling out there um, uh, uh, where uh, different uh, uh, design uh, bureaus would uh, be funded for very similar actual programs. Uh, like a famous case in the late 60s where uh, two design bureaus uh, came up with almost identical uh, ICBMs. Uh, uh, so the leadership could not choose between them, so they created a special commission uh, led by academician Keldish, uh, who made a very wise and very scientific decision. Uh, let us... Oh, 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 actually, or deploy both. <laughs> uh, so, uh, well, in fact, the U.S. and uh, the Soviet system were very actually similar. I would say that competition today is uh, somewhat more like, like intense in the sense that uh, the military plays a much actually bigger role than was the case in the Soviet Union. In fact, now uh, the Russian military plays about the same role you know, acquisition and R&D, as does the Pentagon. 
That was not the case uh, during the Soviet time. And the finance ministry now also plays a much more visible actual role. So yes, there is more competition there. Uh, yes, and some programs get actually canceled for financial, for example. All the reasons that we've seen uh, two such programs uh, just this decade uh, that were canceled. Uh, one is Barguzin. Mm, so, Oh, look at another rubbish. So I, so so when I shook hand, uh, um, my head, I mostly uh, disagreed with uh, the old American view of the old Soviet actual system for R&D. Thanks, Nikolai. Sarah, do you want to come in on this as well? I do. I actually um, <clears throat> had a thought sort of sparked by something that Nikolai said. Um, you know, one of the things that I've found to be particularly interesting in the cases that we're looking at, and I should say I have the current privilege of editing our, our working draft, so I've really had a chance to read a careful, do a careful read through of our findings so far. Um, so I feel kind of prepped to answer this. Um, one of the things that, that seems to come across in a lot of the histories of these systems is that, um, you know, most of them, the idea was sort of conceived of in the Soviet Union, and they were framed as, you know, there would be a broad call for, um, you know, we need to figure out some way to circumvent or undermine U.S. ballistic missile defense. And then there would be the various sort of entrepreneurs within industry who would put forward a recommendation. And to Nikolai's point, um, and again, this was something that, that he put in, in, in the draft, um, it, oftentimes many of these would be funded at the same time. And so the upshot of that now is that uh, Russian weapons developers who are looking back through some of the kind of um, fundamental research, research that was conducted during the Soviet Union have this huge roster of things to choose from because there were these multiple systems and multiple sort of conceptual approaches that, that were funded, even if they didn't actually go anywhere during the Soviet Union. And I didn't touch upon this in, in the theory because I think it's sort of, you know, beyond the remit of, of this talk potentially, but one of the, the aspects of Michael Horowitz's adoption capacity theory is this notion that if you are able to decrease the per unit cost of a military innovation, that can actually increase the likelihood in, in combination with a number of other institutional factors that that technology will then be adopted. And I think there's a real argument to be made that there is some cost cutting that has, that has been derived from looking back through the Soviet legacy projects that are part of what are perhaps allowing some of these systems to progress the entire way through the innovation cycle to adoption today that might not have been feasible when they were originally conceived of. So that's just a sort of additional, um, you know, perhaps beyond the scope of, of George's question, uh, thought that came into my mind. Thanks, Sarah. Before I move on to Ian, did anybody else have anything that they wanted to say on this point? Okay, Ian, um, you're, you're gonna play the role of the skeptic today. So. Uh, why don't you uh, show yourself and ask your question? I'm always uh, skeptical, uh, Bill. So I've, I've typed my question um, in, in chat and I'd encourage folks to, to read it. I won't read it out verbatim. Um, but my, my question really is like, should we care? Why should we care about these systems? Um, if they were developed or if the concepts kind of came from um, a way to overcome missile defenses, you know, there's also been kind of um, uh, uh, some suspicion that these might be designed to be traded off um, uh, as part of a, a, a deal um, uh, around uh, 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 missile defense trading off with, uh, with, with, with these systems. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, a factual question too here. I think of them as second strike systems, and this is then just another thing. So I think of these as uh, being quite redundant, um, uh, uh, a bit of a distraction from, um, uh, from kind of uh, more pressing issues. Uh, but I'd invite people to correct me or... Um, uh, tell me that I'm wrong on those fronts. So my, my question is, should we actually, are, are these significant weapons um, and um, should we uh, uh, care about them in a way that we, 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 we don't already about um, uh, Russia's uh, secure deterrent? Okay, thanks, Ian. Who uh, amongst my team would like to, let me see, if, I'm, I'm sure Nikolai is ready to respond to, to all of these questions, but let me see if, uh, if Michael, Hanna, or Sarah wanted to take a, a shot at this. Who's got her hand or, up, Bill? Pardon? Hannah's got her hand up. Well, Hannah, okay, you're, you're not on my screen at the moment, but Hannah, you have the, you have the sure. floor. I'll let others come in on avant-garde and Borovesnik, which are more strictly second strike weapons um, supposed to deter U.S. missile defense. But the other three systems, Poseidon, Sirakon, and Kinjal, do have potential significant war fighting applications that go much beyond the narrow second strike capability. 
We know of Poseidon that one of its potential applications, though there are concerns about command and control and detectability, is uh, that they could strike uh, US aircraft carrier groups. Um, with Tsirkan and, uh, Tsirkan and Kinjal, we know that they will have quite wide application in terms of regional theaters where they might be deployed. Kinjal has been tested already, I believe, in the Arctic. Others have noted that we shouldn't be surprised if we see Kinjal appearing in Syria at some point. Um, multiple air bases in Russia, I believe, are being upgraded in order to be able to deploy Kinjal. With Tsirkan, with the anti-ship um, application, we also know that Tsirkan is supposed to be deployed to the Black Sea Fleet, the Pacific Fleet. Um, Nikolai, uh, uh, compliment me if, if I forget other applications, but these systems could see a quite wide application in terms of more conventional war fighting strategies. With uh, Avangard and uh, Budavistnik, and to what extent they, they go beyond the second strike capabilities that Russia already has, I think others might be better placed to answer. Thank you very much, Hannah. The, the one thing, uh, Michael, you want to come in? Did I see your hand up? Uh, yeah, just quick. Um, yes, I would say Beravesnik is a second strike weapon, but I think it is worth cons worth thinking about, at least in terms of um, safety and and uh, environmental risks because of what happened in Yonoksa. Uh, last year, and because they are apparently de determined to continue testing it. So they're going to keep throwing tiny nuclear reactors into the water. So that's probably something we should keep an eye on. Thank you, Michael. I think, I mean, another uh, kind of way to answer this question uh, uh, has to do with the impact of these systems on US military. Uh, innovation and policy. Uh, and so it, it's not just a question of what's driving the, the, the Russian systems, but how they're perceived by the by the, uh, their uh, US counterparts who are making decisions. In that regard, I think it, it maybe is an appropriate time uh, to say a little bit about arms control and the implications of our findings you know, for arms control. And so I don't know, Nikolai, if uh, you wanted to say a word or two about uh, what we have learned so far uh, may mean in terms of prospects for uh, future arms control, assuming that uh, in the next administration uh, or beyond uh, there is any interest in any kind of arms control. Yes, thank you, Bill. I uh, just wanted uh, to say that I fully agree uh, with Hannah and uh, to Ian's question. I just wanted to point out that uh, well, it was already actually said that uh, that programs were driven uh, uh, by the expected uh, capability of U.S. missile defense, uh, not by the capability that we see today. So, so yes, they a little bit like overdid, I think. But uh, yeah, uh, so arms control implications are kind of uh, very uh, quite significantly all across uh, these five systems. Uh, about avant-garde, we already know, as Rush has already said, that it will be subject uh, to new start and it will definitely be subject to other uh, uh, future treaties, if such a treaty uh, emerges in the foreseeable future. Uh, it's much more challenging when we talk about uh, systems uh, that are designed for uh, the warfighting role, uh, like Kinjal, and Sirkon is in part also of Poseidon uh, because we do not have any treaties, we do not have any experience, we do not have any framework uh, to address uh, uh, these systems. Uh, to do that, uh, it, is, it will actually be necessary uh, to include into arms control a whole large class or weapons that uh, so far have remained completely outside of arms control, and I mean uh, long-range, primarily conventional or uh, dual-capable weapons, such as the sea-launched cruise missiles, uh, 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 air-launched cruise missiles, and so on and so forth. Uh, so far, the United States has actually been quite reluctant 
how to put these on negotiating table. Um, it always actually thought that that was not a very wise policy. It was a very short-sighted policy uh, because uh, before Russia actually acquired all similar systems, uh, the United States could have obtained a much better uh, deal. Uh, 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 now that Russia got them and is actually moving into technologies uh, that the United States does not have, such as Kinshaw is the so-called ballistic system, um, yes, it will be much more difficult uh, for the United States to negotiate an acceptable agreement. Uh, uh, but that's kind of like a separate, yeah, maybe very technical kind of question. But the bottom line is there are no so arms control tools uh, that can address uh, the war fighting type kind of systems. And Poseidon finally stands completely like, apart from everything because it can be classified as a torpedo or it can be classified as a submarine. Uh, but it's so, so, um, uh, on, on, on not the usual submarine uh, because of, um, it's a robot, it's, it's unmanned. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there are reports that it can actually also launch torpedoes. So it's a system outside any kind of classes and trying you know, uh, to fit it into uh, an existing category will be exceptionally difficult. Uh, so it's, I actually see like, a lot of challenges and I see uh, also uh, that Russia is actually going around or going through loopholes uh, inventing systems that uh, do not easily fit into uh, so arms control frameworks that we've inherited from 50 years of uh, doing the job. So uh, yes, we need to, uh, to find ways, but this will not be easy and it will take political decision and political will on both sides, uh, something that I don't see today, unfortunately. Thanks, I think, Sarah, I'm gonna let you weigh in here and then I know Sig has a two-fingered intervention and then I have uh, Jeff Knopf. So that's the kind of the sequence here. So Sarah, uh, uh, why don't you uh, uh, say whatever you'd like to, and then we'll uh, uh, let Sig ask his follow-on question. Thanks, Bill. Um, this is less, uh, you know, um, a sort of concrete um, response to some of what Nikolai said, but more uh, further explanation of what some of the impetus for this study was. So one of the things that I found very interesting when we were kind of conceiving of this this proof of concept is the notion that there could be moments in the innovation cycle when it is actually easier to engage in arms control. And, you know, sort of intellectually, my initial thought would be that once a system has already been deployed, so it's completed the innovation cycle and mass production has begun, that seems like it should be a more difficult time to engage in arms control than at some point earlier in the cycle when perhaps there are technical challenges that are in fact internally making it quite difficult to continue that process on. Um, whether or not we as kind of outsiders looking in will ever be able to identify what those real points of inflection are, I, I don't know, but I do think that there is real value in, in tracing the history of the innovation cycle from the very conception of these ideas because there are certainly moments where the programs got canceled and we can kind of understand what some of the reasons are for that. Um, so I think as we're thinking about future prospects for arms control, it's worth uh, us determining as a research group whether there is some predictive power here in, in, in terms of thinking about moments in potential innovation cycles in the future when it might be easy to kind of put, put the brakes on uh, relative to how difficult that process is. Um, that, that's excellent. I, I'm glad you made that point. I hope it finds its way into your uh, draft that you're working on right now, because I think it's a very important one. So okay. don't forget it when, you, when we're done with the seminar here. Uh, Sig, you want to uh, follow up? Uh, thank you, Bill. I just wanted to make a, um, I had a two finger comment on Ian's very good question. Uh, and Michael actually got the part of my concern. Uh, and. And my concern is the following, you know, the, the question was, um, so why should we be concerned about these systems? And of course, we typically look at it from our standpoint, are they gonna be used against us? How do we deter against them? My major concern about those systems, at least three of them, and I wouldn't describe them just as novel, I would describe them as crazy. 
you know, from a nuclear weapons guy's standpoint, I mean, when you combine a nuclear warhead with a nuclear reactor, for heaven's sakes, you know, the, the nuclear warhead is not this isolated thing that sits inside of this cocoon. It's affected in every which way by everything around it and what that goes through in what we call the stockpile, the target sequence. And to all of a sudden think you're going to mate it with a nuclear reactor and the potential dangers associated with that. Or you're going to put it on a hypersonic glide vehicle where we don't fully understand exactly what the loads are, the temperatures, and everything else. This is crazy. And so these things are not safe. Uh, and so that doesn't necessarily affect us, you know, as such in terms of defense posture. It affects us because we don't want any nuclear weapons blowing up, uh, you know, anywhere on the world. And so somehow, if we could get back, you know, to some of the discussions we had in the 1990s to talk about warhead safety and talk about those things, that would really be crucial. So that's my concern about the weapon system. Just uh, one, one other uh, final comment in terms of trying to understand what the different uh, organizations within Russia uh, think about in terms of, uh, of these systems. It was very unusual that in, uh, in my book uh, on, um, on Doom to Cooperate, that Radi Ilkayev, who was my counterpart for many years uh, in Sarov, uh, in, in Vidyev, he actually wrote a paper for that book that was called Nuclear Weapons for Russia. And it's really interesting. It's the first time I've ever seen one of their nuclear designer people uh, to offer why nuclear weapons and what's important. And, and I, um, I think it might be useful for people to go back uh, and, and look at that. So thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Like that's, that's really helpful. And we, we will go back. I remember, uh, I think you're making that point in another seminar. And so I, 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 we have to follow up on that. Uh, Jeff, before I call on you, I think Nikolai also has a two finger. So thank you for your patience, uh, Nikolai. Yes, I, uh, also actually uh, I will also respond to the question by Jeff. Uh, uh, the thing about avant-garde is that uh, yes, it's hyper. Let Jeff ask the question before you respond to it. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's been circulating. But Jeff, do you want to ask your question? Well, Nicola can respond if he wants, and I'll ask a slightly broader question when it's my turn. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that the fact that avant-garde is hypersonic actually does not mean much because every actually, so like every warhead, like a strategic missile that descends, uh, it descends uh, at hypersonic speed, so it doesn't really matter uh, uh, the fact that it's hypersonic. Uh, 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 the only new thing about avant-garde is or the fact that it maneuvers, yes, yes, it's not about the speed. Uh, so when we talk about hypersonic innovation, we talk about Kinjal, we talk about Serkon, but not about avant-garde, yes, it's the maneuverability that's new. So um, yeah, I would not really uh, be concerned about avant-garde's all impact on strategic stability or things like that. Okay, thank you, Nikolai. Um, Jeff, you want to uh, uh, use that as a, a uh, Starting point for your question. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, uh, let me just say uh, very quickly. I really appreciate the points that um, Michael and and Ben Sig uh, just made, and um, great to see you, Sig. By the way, um, but you know when we talk about weapon systems, so much of the time we focus on uh, what do they add to a country's defense capabilities or deterrent capabilities, or what are the implications for strategic stability. And I think the you know potential for um, unintended consequences like environmental disasters or accidents uh, is actually um, often given short shrift, but, but those are real uh, considerations with these systems. Um, uh, but, but here's um, my question. I, I'd like to um, ask the, the group um, to maybe step back from the specific focus of the project uh, and ask whether um, what you discovered has any implications for how we understand Russian uh, grand strategy more broadly. So, um, you know, the the external driver was sort of limited to essentially uh, defensive, reactive motivations that um, uh, we feel insecure, and in, uh, procuring these new weapon systems will uh, restore our sense of uh, security. 
Um, and, and I think that's absolutely true, right? Russia uh, has multiple drivers here. Um, uh, U.S. ballistic missile defense systems and, and withdrawing from the ABM treaty was one big one, um, but obviously also really big concerns about NATO expansion uh, and about the kinds of um, uh, precision uh, conventional strike capabilities that the U.S. started to demonstrate in, in the wars of the uh, 1990s, early 2000s. So um, real external security drivers. Uh, but in addition to that, I, you know, I can envision two other uh, kind of external drivers that might also be present. So, um, you know, in the proliferation literature, we often distinguish between security motivations and, and prestige motivations. Uh, and my sense of Russia is that they are super duper status conscious. Right, and that to some extent, maybe these weapons are bright, shiny objects that they can sort of point to and, and drive around on military parades um, that, you know, independent of any strategic uh, effects of them, they just sort of show off something about Russia's capabilities and, and uh, ability to, to stay a player in the world of, of global uh, superpowers. Right, and then, and then the third one, which is trickier, um, and I think it's a version of Ian's question, might there be some degree of offensive motivation here as well. You know, Putin in particular strikes me as somebody who's very attractive, to, uh, very attracted to uh, coercive bargaining strategies. Um, you know, the ability to threaten and intimidate people as a way to, um, you know, get your way with them. Uh, and uh, having these kinds of capabilities could also be uh, a shield to allow for more Crimea type uh, interventions without fear of, of a NATO response because of the escalatory potential. So. You know, are there motivations here that go beyond just sort of restoring deterrence? Thank you, Jeff. I'm, I'm going to let, um, I think Sarah wanted to weigh in on this. I think one thing that we, I just will throw out a, a, a point here. Uh, I mean, there's usually this exceptionally long lag between the promotion of a concept uh, and its eventual adoption. And so I think we need to be careful about assuming that uh, uh, a, an announcement uh, by Putin or anyone else uh, about a new system is going to have a tremendous impact simply because of the amount of time it takes to move from that point in time to the actual deployment, which is one reason I think we also see so many of these systems that were really initiated in the Soviet period, uh, which are, are now being uh, relied upon, uh, tweaked in one fashion or another to, to actually uh, develop further. So. Uh, we need to be conscious about the, uh, you know, the this, this life cycle, which often is a very uh, long one. But I, I, rather than say more, Sarah, why don't you uh, uh, take the floor? Um, thanks, Bill. Jeff, that, I mean, I had a similar kind of thought initially going into this project, like is how, to what extent is sort of the narrative that these weapons are telling really the, one of the driving forces behind their innovation and I think a key for us in, in continuing to conduct our study, or at least for me and my thinking about this, is marrying your question with um, Sig and Michael's points, which are that there, there is a serious cost benefit analysis that needs to take place here, and whether the normative or prestigious value of these weapons could ever possibly outweigh the really significant um, investment and possible losses that they could result in. And I'm thinking here in particular of the death of those five individuals involved in the Neonics of testing. Um, I, don't, I don't know, and I, I kind of doubt, but I, but I do think even more broadly, there's a separate question too of what are officials saying and what is the official discourse about these weapons and what is actually happening um, kind of behind the scenes. And I think that that's the point Bill was making too. But it is interesting to note that at least in Evangelista's work and in, and in some of the other um, kind of more contextual work that has helped us flesh that out, it's very clear that having um, high level official bureaucratic investment in these weapon systems is absolutely critical to seeing them through the innovation process. And so there is an extent to which um, there's some face saving that happens. If Putin says we're developing Budovesnik and it's gonna do X, Y, and Z thing, then it's gonna make it really difficult even if there are roadblocks to kind of give up that process. And so figuring out where that balance is and how, how Russia is internally determining that calculus and whether it's different from system to system and what the factors are that go in there, I think is going to be, you know, the, the sort of big umbrella study that, that our small slice is falling under. But I think those are really important questions and I'm, I'm glad you raised that. Thank you. I mean, the other thing I, I would just add here, you know, Jeff, I mean, we know from 
a number of, of uh, important case studies of US weapon systems, uh, that it's often the military that one might assume would be the beneficiary of the new weapon system uh, that is most opposed uh, to the deployment. And in fact, uh, there was one quote, I, I mean, I, I like it, my staff, but, I mean, others are probably tired of my uh, making reference to it, but uh, it's a case that, that Stalin, uh, as well as his generals, almost without exception, had absolutely no interest uh, in the uh, adoption of a variant of the German V-2 uh, rocket. They were not interested in ballistic missiles. And there's this one marvelous quote uh, that, uh, and it, I think is marvelous, that Andrew uh, Aldrin has, uh, and it's attributed to a, a Red Army Marshal in 1948, who is alleged to have declared, and I quote here, what are you doing? You put more than four tons of alcohol in a rocket. If you give me this, uh, give my division this alcohol, it could take any town, but your rocket couldn't even hit the town. Who needs it? And so it, it's kind of illustrative. We shouldn't assume that it's the military that necessarily is embracing uh, these new weapons, uh, weapon systems. Uh, I think, and I apologize if I am off my, my list here, I think that Philip is, is next. Uh, and so Philip, we're pleased to see you here and look forward to, uh, to your question. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And I just wanted to say kudos to everyone uh, working on this. This is, I love the combination of kind of rigor and policy relevance. And I think this is just intellectually, it's just really exciting. So I'm thrilled that it's happening here and that I'm not attending a seminar that someone else is putting on. So I'm proud of you guys. It's the short version of that. And then I do have a question, which is, you know, Sig said earlier, some of these systems are kind of crazy. I mean, some of these are kind of like something out of Dr. Strangelove or James Bond, and in particular, uh, Poseidon or Status Sex and this salted warhead. Like, it's, it's crazy. Like, it's, it's sort of like one of these truth is stranger than fiction kind of situations. And so I just wonder, should one be a bit concerned about that? And if so, is one concerned about a policy making process that gives birth to these kinds of systems or a weapons design process that goes down these quirky avenues and then that gets support for them? And it's kind of a, you know, I'm, it's sort of a crude version of questions that in some respects have been asked earlier, but I guess I find some of this concerning and I'm wondering what you think, having taken more of a deep dive into it than I have. Let me say one thing and then I'll, I'll let others respond, Phil. Thanks for your question. I mean. It, it was something that, I mean, it's an intriguing uh, question. Uh, I mean, Sarah, uh, Sam Meyer and I, uh, in our study uh, dealing with um, radiological weapons, uh, were quite fascinated by the intersection between science fiction and actual military policy. In fact, we have a piece that'll be coming out in the fall issue of international security on our uh, study, as so I kind of advertising that uh, uh, this fall. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, they were less impressed with the emphasis on science fiction and that intersection. So we'll have to write another article. But uh, it is very interesting, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's crazier, you know, the, the science fiction or, or the real world. And in fact, at least with respect to radiological weapons, one could argue that it was, uh, you know, Robert Heinlein uh, and his publisher who were initially focused on this topic uh, and then it was seized upon in a, in a in rather similar fashion by the, the, the actual U.S. government. Um, but what we discovered in the course of our study, looking at uh, you know the Poseidon in particular, was that in in some respects, you know, one can uh, actually trace the concept at least back to someone who you would not think of uh, as crazy, and, and that is. Uh, uh, Mr. Sakharov, who uh, in 1961 was actually promoting, uh, at least according to his own memoirs, uh, the, the notion of uh, a highly radioactive uh, torpedo, uh, in part because he was concerned about how do you deliver the Tsar Bomba, and so he was looking for another form of, uh, of a delivery system. He was disabused of this notion, according to his memoir, by uh, another Russian, by a Russian admiral, uh, and uh, quickly uh, lost interest himself in this. So uh, there are origins that go back to uh, individuals that you might not uh, associate with this kind of crazy idea, but it appears to have been a, an idea of here at, at, at one point in, in time. But uh, I would be pleased for others who, who may want to 
uh, to say something on this. Nikolai, you have a, a two finger, but I mean, you can use a right. Yes, so, uh, uh, I just want to add, uh, to what you said is that uh, we actually do not know about the Soviet warhead on Poseidon. Uh, that's a conjecture, that's a hypothesis that came uh, from, you know, non-governmental sources, including Western sources. Uh, uh, well, uh, would in fact, uh, official sources, especially the Russian Navy, uh, do emphasize the entire ship qualities as well. Uh, so, yes, I would be actually cautious about assuming missions and especially capabilities of systems that are not yet uh, near deployment. That's kind of the thing. We know a lot about avant-garde because it's already being deployed. We know a lot about Kinjal and Zircon. They are in the last stages of, of, of testing. Uh, it's hard to tell um, much about Poseidon. Uh, yes, they do plan uh, to proceed to testing, but we have not yet actually seen tests from submarines, so it's hard to assume uh, with any degree of certainty of uh, the mission. Uh, and about Burevesnik, it's in such an early stage that Putin talked about it as a done fact, but in fact, it's not a deal done. It's still over many years, probably. So I'll look into the future. Yes, I agree with, uh, with what Sarah said. Uh, they'll probably uh, try to see it through because Putin like, advertised it to the entire world. Uh, but still, uh, yeah, I think there is even like some chance they might actually cancel it. Thanks, Nikolai. Sarah? Um, hi, Philip. First of all, thanks for joining. Um, that's a really interesting question and I don't have an answer, but one of the things that I've been kind of mulling over is um, the fact that, you know, obviously these weapons are under development now or are in some stage of the innovation process, but all of them, at least we have found in our research, and as I mentioned previously, have sort of the origin of these ideas in the Soviet Union. And so you have to wonder in response to your question, if there hadn't been these Soviet predecessors, would Russia have actually come up with these crazy ideas? And that's a counterfactual that I don't know the answer to, but one of the questions that Hannah has raised, and in, in, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but in our kind of conversations as we were leading up to this presentation and thinking about our product is, you know, what will actually happen once that roster of Soviet legacy projects is depleted? I mean, what, what will the future of Russian innovation look like and how will that have an effect on it? And obviously, I don't know, but I wonder if we would see a decrease in some of these systems that seem really crazy and if this is a product of the fact that they kind of existed previously and were developed in this very different normative environment, um, uh, or whether that is actually something that seems appealing from kind of a war fighting and strategic standpoint in Russia today. So I, we'll have to, you know, look into that and maybe we can think about some, you know, ways to um, explore that question a little bit more with, with the material that we have now, considering that we're watching the innovation process happen live, so we don't exactly know what's going to happen um, down the road, but thanks for that question. Thank you. I don't see other uh, questions in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to go from one screen to the next just to see if anybody has their hand up or is trying to get my attention. Now, if not, what I would suggest, I don't see uh, further questions. I, uh, I personally found this to be, you know, very stimulating and it did exactly what I have it, had in mind in terms of uh, you know, in progress uh, uh, reports in the form of a CNS seminar. I think uh, there were a lot of very useful ideas that were conveyed to me and I, I suspect to other members of our team. Let me ask if any of uh, uh, the, the team would like to say uh, some uh, words in closing, whether uh, Sarah, Michael, Hannah, Nikolai, you all have a, a few minutes uh, if you'd like to say any, anything at this time. Anybody? Want to take the floor? I've been going on and on and on, so no. <laughs> okay. Well, look, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, I really enjoyed this, appreciated it. Uh, again, it's great to welcome Hana to our, uh, to our team. And uh, we look forward to doing more of these uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So I hope you all have a, well, I guess in, in Europe, it's 11, close to 11 o'clock. 
uh, here it's not quite so late. Uh, enjoy either your, your evening or the rest of the afternoon and look forward to seeing you soon. So take care, everybody. Bye-bye.